Well, I wanted to say Che Baba to everyone. Welcome. We're happy to be here today. Uh, Peter Nordine has been asked to speak about Meher Baba and what he had to say about the unborn. Um, he has some, he's done some research for us. So there's some wonderful stories that he has for us today that he'd like to share. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Peter. Che Baba. Thank you for inviting me. Since the issue of abortion has become prominent in the news recently, people have been asking, did Meher Baba say anything about abortion? As far as I know, Baba didn't make any blanket statements about abortion. Not, however, because he was unconcerned. He knows that abortion is just the last in a series of actions prompted by one's sanskaras and reactions to one's fate. Condemning an act is simplistic, but it's not always indicative of the actor's motive and purpose. And the law of karma is driven by motive. Regarding abortion as a social and cultural issue, there are deficiencies and inaccuracies on both sides of the argument. From the religious perspective, condemnation of abortion as a mortal sin is based upon the belief that we are our bodies and that we have only one chance to live. Baba, Mayor Baba, has explained at length the process of reincarnation and the workings of the law of karma through the function of sanskaras. We are not our bodies. The body is a biomechanical vehicle that allows the spirit to experience and spend a nexus of sanskaras during a lifetime. And one sure detail about being born is that death will eventually come. Yet, amazingly, we cling to all things related to the body. Baba has revealed one important point about the soul entering the fetus. We've all heard it. He explained that generally the soul enters the womb during the sixth or seventh month of pregnancy. Though we have seen examples of the soul entering the body just days before birth. This does not mean, however, that anyone is free to terminate a pregnancy without risk of karmic obligation. It all depends upon the motive. The perspective from the other side of the argument is, this is my body and I can do what I want. Nobody will tell me what I should do. Yes, that is true, but it reminds me of a remark Erich once made. It was in response to the New Age attitude. You can have whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. And Eric said, yes, you can have whatever you want, provided you are willing to pay the price. And don't forget that the law of karma is always there. But rather than condemn anyone caught in a series of events due to a lack of judgment, Baba focused on the root of all problems, self-interest expressed through lust, greed, and anger instead of dismissing actions as simply good or bad, he explained that our behavior results in more binding or less binding for ourselves. But once when Baba was discoursing on the subject, he gave an example of actions that incur strong binding bad sanskaras. He used the term like murder and illicit sex. Though Baba's moral code is strict by Western, typical Western standards, he was always merciful and forgiving to any sinner that sincerely repented. Baba explained that there is no such thing as eternal damnation, which is, you know, if you dig deeply, it will be a point of conflict for Western religion. 
No such thing as eternal damnation. How can there be when everyone and everything is really God? That does not mean, however, that there is no experience of hell. Hell is a state, not a place, experienced after a lifetime in which one was preoccupied with self-indulgent action. Hell is also only temporary, though it may not seem that way when one is caught in an excruciating state of it. Baba once commented, All souls must suffer because all souls must be redeemed. The ancient infinite eternal one is responsible for bringing each and every one gradually to redemption though it is not so easy for God, but that is his game. Now, this is a story that Erich told sometimes in the 70s. It will give you an idea of how Baba's perspective is much deeper than the cycle of life and death. It begins in the 1940s, before the new life, you remember that it was a habit of people, Baba lovers, to contact Baba about issues that were personal and important, like informing a closest family member. There was a young couple. They had a son, young, three or four years old. And the child had developed some health issue with his belly, and it was determined that he had a bad appendix. Baba happened to be in the area at the time, and the wife, who was a Baba lover, came to Baba and informed him, our child is ill, and the doctors have said he's got to have an operation. If he gets appendicitis, he'll die. Baba looked concerned. Hmm. He looked away for a few seconds and, and said to this woman, how would it be if you just let him go? What? Baba? You? You? Baba said, would you be okay with that to just let him go? No, Baba, he's just a child. He's an innocent child. How can we do such a thing? Baba said, oh, okay, okay. Go ahead with the operation. So they did go ahead with the operation. The child survived, grew up. Meantime, people who were not in favor of Meher Baba, it was just another thing. You see this man, he will say any outrageous thing how perverse is that? Is he doing this just to get attention, to say such a thing? Years went on. The wife remained devoted to Baba. The, the young child grew up to be an older teenager. And then one day when Baba was in the same area, a young girl came to him, very nervous. She wanted a private and personal interview. Uh, she told Baba, I'm pregnant. You know, I'm not married, I'm pregnant. This is such a scandal. In, in India, which has much traditionally a higher moral code than the West, and the West is, oh, okay, well, I'm pregnant. But in India, it's a very shameful thing, especially with Baba's high moral code. She was from a family of Baba lovers. And uh, of course, Baba questioned her, and it was determined that the boy who had had the appendicitis when he was a child, 
and now made her pregnant. He was a promiscuous type. So to deal with the situation, give you an idea of how Baba dealt with such a situation in this delicate way, he told the girl, we won't tell your parents. It will be too much for them. They, they, they can't understand it. So to save them the pain, this is what we'll do. I'm going to send you to stay with so-and-so, the couple, for a year. We'll tell them you're going to go to uh, school with, with, uh, in that location and uh, Baba wants you to stay with them. And we'll keep this quiet. And that's the way it was resolved. The girl went through with the pregnancy. The baby was given up for adoption. In the meantime, the mother of the boy who had made her pregnant, of course, they were informed. They weren't left out of the picture. There was a concern there. And the way Erich told the story, and the woman who had been adamant about making sure that he had the, the appendectomy, uh, one day was there with Bob and said, Bob, I'm so sorry. Now I realize what you were doing. Um, I realize you were just trying to save everyone. And the people who are very close to Baba know that he wouldn't say such a thing unless there was a real situation. He was trying to save that soul, that young boy, from his own sanskaras. So in the cycle of life and death, sanskaras for a certain lifetime could be dropped. We know this, Baba had to explain this before, and that person would be free of that. But this is what he was only trying to save the person from going into a deeper spiral of indulgence and then having to pay the price further. And it's only a little, it's, it's Baba's responsibility to help people to the shortest way to the truth. If they don't take it, it's still okay. It's not eternal damnation. They just have to work it out in another way. That's how that story happened. Interesting thing. Now you know, I take a drink here. <clears throat> you all are familiar with <clears throat> Lynn and Phyllis Ott. They were, what we might say, bohemian artists. And they had quite a colorful history. They got together, lived in a church with their four kids in Woodstock, New York. And through Tom and Yvonne Riley, they heard of Meher Baba in the 60s. And Phyllis, especially first, felt compelled to go and meet Meher Baba. So she did that at the end of 1964. <coughs> she came, she went, traveled to India, came to Marasad, happened to be there at a time when other people were there, like Baba's brother Adi Jr. and his family, other visitors. And on December 21st, they came to Marisad to visit Baba. Baba met the whole group in the morning, and then he had a private interview with Phyllis that afternoon. <clears throat> now this is from a book. I'm going to read excerpts from a book. <clears throat> this book, Love Bade Me Welcome, the Life of Phyllis Ott, which was told and written by Barbara Bamberger Scott. It's an interesting read. This is an excerpt from that about her meeting with Baba. 
Meher Baba was sitting in the chair by the door of Mondeley Hall on December 1st, 1964 at Marizad. I was at his right side sitting on the rug. Erich Jesawala and Francis Brabazon, two of his close companions, were seated with me on the rug. Meher Baba asked Phyllis in gestures interpreted by Erich, why have you come to India? Without looking up, Phyllis answered, I want to give myself to you. I know it's wrong to give yourself to another person, for I know our independence is our divine obligation. Yet somehow, I know it wouldn't be wrong for you to accept me. I want to serve. I do serve, and I serve well, but my own needs get in the way. I can't satisfy my own needs, and they're killing me. Baba responded through Erich, when Baba will be within you, there will be no need to come to India. Earlier in the morning, when Baba had met Phyllis in a larger group, he had told her to bring Lynn to see Baba. So that was the plan for her to serve by accompanying Lynn to India. Yet now, he said, when Baba will be within you, there will be no need to come to India. Baba gestured, who do you take me to be? Baba, uh, Phyllis implored Baba, Baba, I don't know if I can follow you. I'm Jewish and we have had many false messiahs. Though I love you personally, I belong to a faith that is ordered not to worship a man God, only the formless God. Erich interpreting Baba's gestures, Phyllis, Baba wants you to know that he is God. Remembering that Elijah experienced God in a still small voice, Phyllis reverently whispered, I always knew that God is silent, meaning that no spoken words could contain the truth and the presence of the one who is in all. In the years that followed, Phyllis would realize that in the course of her physical meeting with Meher Baba, he had freed her from all tenets of each and every religion. He had told his followers that his purpose was not to establish a religion, and his devotees did not need the binding of creeds. Thereafter, Phyllis's path through worldly experience was to be eased by the faith that Baba is the self within. Always there silently expressing that he is with her as the one God. Then Baba asked, have you read God Speaks? Phyllis answered that she had tried to read it, but she'd gotten pregnant and couldn't concentrate on finishing the book. I became pregnant, Baba, and I felt incapable of taking care of a fifth child. My companion is blind and has great physical needs. I have so much to do. I couldn't have another child without a physical and mental breakdown. I first tried to offer the child to a close person, Lynn's sister, Carol, who was childless. And when she refused, I had a legal abortion and sterilization. I feel bereaved, Baba. And as she spoke, Phyllis heard, felt, and saw herself as a mother, like Rachel in the Bible, who, having climbed to the mountaintop and met God there, was wailing in a terrible lament for her murdered children. In memory, she sees herself coming to cry out to God for women besieged by the burden of childbirth and housework and the care of their mates. She had four children and a handicapped man and no time for herself. She was also a mother who had killed her unborn child, as she recalled, as existential an act as is possible within human law. But at that moment in time, while these emotions were churning in Phyllis's mind, Baba next asked, how well do you understand God speaks? 
Phyllis said, I don't know. Only you can know whether I understand what you have intended. At this, Bob made the sign of a circle with his thumb and forefinger. And Phyllis asked Erich what that meant, and Erich said it meant pretty good. Baba then told Phyllis that he'd like her to read God Speaks three or four times. Then Baba began to gesture with great animation, many movements of hands, and Erich interpreted. Your eyes will weep and weep and weep, and your heart will burn and burn and burn and burn and will be consumed, and you will experience the real. The impact of these words was like a lightning bolt in Phyllis's consciousness, filling her with sudden, overwhelming awe and love for Meher Baba and recognition of his wondrous love and power. The interview was over. Phyllis could not command another second of Baba's attention. Trying to fulfill an obligation to a friend back home, speaking of him to Meher Baba, she was met with Baba's dismissive response. Do you know how many millions of people need me right now? She was sent out of Mondeley Hall to meet Mary and the ladies. Afterwards, Phyllis asked Baba if she could stay with him until her flight was to depart two days later. He replied, no one is allowed to stay here anymore and perhaps to cheer her up, for she was terribly disappointed not to be allowed to stay even two days. Baba's Mondeley told her, very few people are ready to stay with Baba. Phyllis accepted that she must leave almost at once. She was having her first experiences of obedience to a master. Baba later consoled Phyllis and assured her not to grieve, explaining to her that he had given the child whom she had aborted to G.S. and Murti and his wife in Calcutta. G.S. and Murti, Dr. G.S. and Murti, was a professor of philosophy who first heard of Baba as a young student and some years later, when he had the opportunity to visit Maribad during one of the Sahabas in the 50s, probably the birthday celebration Sahabas in 58, Murti became really a Baba lover from that point. He was a good speaker and an animated person and Baba would uh, allow him his company at times. But Murti was from a high caste Brahmin family and the rest of his family were annoyed that he had become dedicated to Meher Baba. And especially his wife. He was married in 1944. His wife wondered why he was smitten with this person. So he knew that if, he, if his wife could just have Baba's darshan, she would change. So at one point they made a trip to Ahmednagar, met Baba, not at Mar Mar Marazad, but in Ahmednagar, and uh, Baba was leaving in the car, but he stopped the car and called Murti and uh, said, why have you come? He said, you didn't want my darshan right now? Why have you come? He said, I didn't, but he said, my wife, I want my wife to have your darshan. Ooh, you want your wife to have my darshan? Mm -hmm. Called her. So he called her. And Baba had her sit in the car next to him, and he took her to Marasad for three days and left Murti there in Ahmednagar with Adi. 
when Murti was called to Marasad, after that period, his wife came and Murti had been concerned how was she going to be treated and how was she and how did she do and Baba made her say out, how are you, very fine, everything is beautiful, thank you. And Baba said, was in a conversation with Murti because he liked to tease Murti a little bit. Uh, Murti was concerned that she should come to love Baba. Baba said, do you love me? Yes, Baba. Do you love me more than him? She looked at Murti and he said, speak out honestly what you feel. Yes, Baba, I love you more than my husband. <laughs> And Baba said, see, Murti, you are put aside now. <laughs> so that was her first meeting with Baba. They came back. Mara had given Saviti, that is Murti's wife, a picture of Baba. They came back to their home. Their mother, Murti's mother, was also living in the same central home, a group home household, family, group home. And she placed that photograph at, in the room, the mother's puja room. It was a bigger photograph. The mother was not dedicated to Baba, so she immediately took that photograph and took it out and gave it back to them and said, I didn't ask this to be in here. If your, if your Meher Baba is so great, why hasn't he given you a child? So now they've been married 20 years and they have no children. So this went on and Murti said, next time I see Baba, I'm going to, we'll see what happens. This is an aggravating issue from the family. None of his other family members were devoted to Baba. So the next time they did come to Baba, uh, they were there at Mondali Hall. Baba asked Saviti, how are you? Baba, I'm fine, thank you. Not, not talking directly to Murti himself. Baba said, you know, I'm in a very good mood. I want to give you a child. Would you, would you take a child? They said, she said, yes, of course, Baba. But we already have a daughter. Oh, you have a daughter. You have a daughter. But was she born, and Baba made that gesture, was she born from your body? Now this is something they kept very quiet, but Baba immediately came out with that. But was she born from your body? And the truth came out that actually she was the daughter of Murti's younger brother, who had by that point five daughters. So one of the older daughters was given to Murti and Saviti to raise as their own. It's a typical thing in India. Because Mani, Baba said, Baba said this also. So in his light mood, Baba said, I'm, I'm in the mood to give you a child. He says, Erich, and Baba looked aside. Uh, Where's that stork register of mine? Stork register. Mary said, I, I don't know anything about it, Baba. I, Baba said, I, I want to know what's next. Is it a girl or a boy? Where is that stork register? And Eric said, Baba said, yeah I, yeah, I know what it is. And Baba said, I'm going to give you a girl. And Baba's sister, Money, was there. And she explained, but Baba, they already have a girl. How about giving them a boy? Bob said, I'm giving you a girl. 
Now, the interesting thing is that they had been, she had been through surgery even. They had done everything they could to uh, to deal with this issue of not having children. And the doctor, trained in England, determined that, I'm sorry, you're barren, it won't be possible for you to have any children. That didn't mean anything to Baba. He said, I'm giving you a girl. So they went back, and the girl was born in April 1965. Okay. So Murti said to his mother, what do you think of Meher Baba now? After all these years, his mother would say, you've had no children all these years? And so Murti would say, no. Yes, all these years, what do you think of Meher Baba now? He gave us a child. He said his mother begrudgingly said, yes, he, he must be kind of God, uh, but if he's not complete God, if he was complete God, he would have given you a son, because of course in India also having a son is the important thing. Nowadays, the vast majority of abortions performed in India are due to the fact that the, the mother, the expectant mother, has an ultrasound which determines that the fetus is a female. So there's also a tradition that for a daughter, a dowry must be paid. It's a very expensive proposal. So mostly, this is another example of abortion for the wrong reason. The females are mostly aborted when there is abortion. Getting back to the story. So she had made that remark. So now, let's get back to Lynn and Phyllis Ott. They came to India again. Now, they were not wealthy people. They had made, given a mortgage on the church they lived in to get money to build Phyllis' a studio, but they used that money to go to India again. So Lynn and Phyllis came to India in October 1965, And they met, that's when Lynn with Villas met Baba at Marizad, October 4th, I believe it was. Now, what Murti had done, there's a Hindu tradition that when a baby is seven months old, there's a ceremony where they give kheer. Kheer is a thing made of rice and sweet rice and milk mixed together. It's like a, ba a sweet baby pablum, and with a special s spoon, a silver spoon, the baby is fed this kheer in the ceremony at seven months. So Murti had decided to do this thing and uh, sent out invitations, including, of course, one to Baba. And Baba immediately contacted him and said, you bring the child to me, I'll do that ceremony for you. So they came to Marizad uh, and arrived in Amanagar on October, on October 5th. The interesting thing is, at the train station, as they arrived, there were Lynn and Phyllis Ott getting ready to board the train to leave. So they met at the train station the two couples. This is now the baby that Baba had told Phyllis was the soul, the spirit soul that she had aborted and he had given to the Murtis. So they met there in the train station, at the train station in Ahmednagar on October 5th. So Murti came 
with his wife, Tamara Zod. Bob had Adi make a special silver spoon for the ceremony that was all done. There's a nice bit of footage of that. We have used that bit of footage in our video, You Alone Exist, with the baby playing on Baba's lap. You see it there. Baba had named the baby himself. When the baby was born, he immediately cabled, you named the baby Mara. So now they came to Marazad and it's the happy scene. Baba does the ceremony and he gestures to them the way he would gesture. Are you happy? Yes, Baba, very happy. And the women were there, so many of the women were there. Are you happy? Everybody's happy. You all are happy, but I'm not happy. What? And Morty said, what, what is it, Baba? What can I do to make you happy? He said, now I want a boy. <laughs> I think back on the story and I think, you know, money wanted a boy, but I think Mara is the one who got involved. It's just typical, all the signs of Mara being involved, that Baba would say, give them a boy. That's my conjecture. So Baba said, I'm going to give you a boy. So after, by the end of 1966, a boy was also born to the Murtis. And Baba named him also Meha Kumar. So those were the two children. After that boy was born, the mother went and took the photograph of Baba and put it in the center of the wall in her puja room. And the whole family then became dedicated to Baba, but there's another part of the story that's very interesting, I'm going to tell you. So Murti's younger brother said, this is quite amazing, your Meher Baba has just given you two children after so long a time. As he said, one girl and one boy. Quite amazing. He said, uh, now I have five girls. I would like to have a boy. Why don't you ask Baba to give me a boy? Morty said, it's not my business to ask Baba things like that. But anyhow, I'll pray. Since you were good enough to give me one of your children, I will pray to Baba to give you a boy. So the next year, a boy was born to his brother and his brother's wife. And then two years later, another boy. And two years later, another boy. And it went on like that. In the meantime, Baba drops his body, but he's still having boys. Now he ends up first with the five girls, and now he had five boys. And at one point, he went, he lived in a different city, he went to GNS Murti, GSN Murti, his brother, and said, we've got to go to Baba. This is enough now. What? What's happened? He said, five, I've got too many children. That's enough. I've got five boys. That's, that's it. He says, I'm organizing a bhajan program for Baba. We have to pray that he stops this. <laughs> and in all... And all this experience, it was not just that, but it was Baba's nature, his personality. All of Murti's family became dedicated to Baba. Now going back to Philosot, uh, this is also what's written in the book. To Philosot, in retrospect, the salience of the conversation she had with Meher Baba regarding her abortion was twofold. First, she was aware that 
He wasn't treating it with the enormous importance with which she had invested it. Though Bao records that Baba consoled her, she recalls that Baba evinced minimal interest in her anguish and directed the conversation back to her reading of God Speaks. This was not unusual. Baba frequently diverted people from engaging in emotional scenes, even sending his disciples to a movie when one of their numbers passed away. And one of the first great examples they had of this was when Baba's own brother Jamsha died. Just the day after he left Marabad in 1926, after the big birthday celebration for Baba there, and Baba seemed so nonchalant about it when many of the Bandali were quite concerned. And that prompted Baba to give one of the great discourses on life and death in the soul. Now second, when Phyllis realized that Meher Baba had in fact taken a personal interest, he had in some subtle way directed her action and transferred parentage from her aborted child to the infant longed for by the Murtis. She was humbled at Baba's use of her anguish, anguished situation to effect this miracle. Meher Baba claimed never to work miracles and discounted their importance. However, Almost everything surrounding the story of the Murti's child has an aura of the miraculous about it. Pondering these events now, Phyllis considers that Meher Baba's understanding of life is transcendent and that this mystical event does not lend itself to any simple interpretation. Phyllis is now 96 years old, uh, living in a nursing home. The fact is, Baba did this often when he, when he wanted to. And yes, it wasn't a miracle because, in fact, there are no miracles for God. It depends on the interpretation of the word, the connotation of the word miracle. But remember, he is the head of all levels of the supervening order of the universe. So it's simply an assignment. It's not really miraculous. Souls will be born. They have to be born in this question of assignment. It's just another way of showing us Baba's all-knowing nature. Dar and Amrit are coming next month. You might remember Amrit's story when Baba called her to be engaged and married to his nephew Dara. She was called to stay at Marazad for some time. And their engagement was one day and the wedding was the next day. It was also the same period of celebration of Mara's birthday and it also happened to be the 24th of December, Dara's birthday. So all that was happening there. And on one day, I believe it was the, the wedding day, Baba told them, you're going to go to England. You stay there until your son is born. And you will name him Meherwan, and he spelled out, not Meherwan, but Meherwan. Baba typically named boys Meherwan instead of Meherwan, but sometimes he did name them Meherwan, like him. The next day, Amrit says, Baba told her, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to give you one son, I'm going to give you two sons. And he made the gesture, I have a lot of souls in the waiting room and they need to be born. So he said, I'm going to give you two sons. Don't come back from England to India until you have two sons. Mara will decide the name of the second son. 
So Merav chose Jamshed, the second brother, Baba's elder brother. His name was Jamshed in the same family. So Mehawan and Jamshed are the two boys. And we know them. Mehawan is here with his wife Molly in Asheville. All right. So let's. Let's go to questions and answers. Okay, we'll open up if anyone would like to raise their hand if they have a question for Peter. This is a good time to do it. Comments, anything, discussion? I just wanted to thank you. That was such a beautiful story about Phyllis. Yes. Very, very well, the, the link between the two families hasn't really been, let's say, elucidated so much. So I thought it would, it would be an important thing for people to hear how Baba had it within his family, how he did things. Hmm. Jeffrey, did you have something you wanted to offer? Yeah, well, I don't think it's really offer, but question. Um, thank you, Peter, very much for your share and for your talk and uh, elaborating on the Phyllis Ott story. I did look it up in Lord Mayor, but Lord Mayor is not quite as full as the version he gave. Um, my question really is, you make it very clear that this really is a karmic issue. And when I was attending Baba meetings in Asheville, particularly when we're talking about discourses and karma. It was my understanding that Baba can help with our samskaras, hopefully to balance them or remove them or whatever it is, it's still a mystery to me. But karma is something that you would not mess with. To, or deal with, or get involved with. I mean, I'm having trouble finding the right words for it. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that from my personal experience, Baba has laid out what some of my karma is or was. Yeah. And how much of that is illusion, I do not really know. Mm -hmm. More will probably be revealed. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on how Baba treats karma, if you will. So, first thing we remember is that he is above all laws super, of the supervening order of the universe. Six ingredients in creation cause and effect, time and space, law and nature. And Bama said the two most important ingredients are law and nature. And the highest law is the law of karma. The ramifications of the law of karma are order. With an eventual resolution. And he says, the law of karma is God's will manifested in creation. But above God's will is his wish. And that's where he makes adjustments. People should never assume that Bob will just take care of my karma and I'll it'll be fine because he, know, he knows that a, a person's fate, we don't say karma like that. Karma means that karma means the law. So there's a tendency in the West to use karma for the word fate, but it's fate. The fate of, one, of a person's karma is there because of past actions, and it is best for that person to go through that experience of balancing. Now, if the person's destiny is liberation, then the person's fate has less importance. 
and the difference between fate and destiny. The destiny of the soul is what the end game is going to be. And Baba, by the way, says all of this is there latent from the point of creation in each one. It's mind-boggling, but that's the infinitude of infinite consciousness. So if a person is going to be liberated, it's not necessary that they endlessly go on suffering in creation because their, their destination is infinite bliss. But if a person has to be a perfect master, they will have to suffer the effects. They will have to suffer more and more, which gives them a higher final destiny. Why? Because it has to do with their connection to creation, ultimately. Because the last lifetime of any soul is the whole purpose. In the meantime, as Baba says, the purpose, if there is not the end, is never fulfilled. And there's that sense of frustrated disappointment in a way, it might be a little bit, it might be great. The, Baba used that word to describe the hell state, disappointment. Disappointment, but that, the intensity of that depends upon the person's sense cars. So Baba can do anything he wants with karma. He doesn't interfere with the law because there's no the best explanation he's, he's given for that, I see directly, is from the message highest of the high, which, by the way, we're just doing a video of. And hopefully we'll have it done soon. We're waiting for a few more images. And it'll be out soon. But in the highest of the high, he spells that out beautifully. And it, it, Baba gave this message, the highest of the high, after years of people coming to him asking for intervention, or as he would say, a wish list. We have in the early diaries, and Baba would say to the Mandali, can you believe it? This person came. They actually left a wish list of the things they wanted him to do for them. So Baba would put up with this for years and years, and one of the things with the new life, as you recall, is Baba says, stop asking me for things like this. That's it now. You're responsible before God. But it still was going on, and in Dehradun in 1953 in September, that incident compelled Baba to spontaneously dictate that message, the highest of the high. It's a great message. The Mandali really liked it because Baba really just, the highest of the high. They felt it's about time he speaks up about this, and it's about time he speaks up in his silence about this issue. So it's a good message. Now, I don't know if that's clear, Jeffrey, in your regarding your question about karma and one's karma, but I'll, uh, there's one more thing. Adi, Adi Sr., Adi K. Rani used to, in his talk, sometimes use this example. Yes, everyone has their fate. They must go through things. It is the law of karma. But let us suppose you had to have an accident. If you were an ordinary person without connection, you'd have an accident, a car accident, and you would suffer, and there would be no ambulance, and this and that would, would happen. But if you are Meher Baba's lover, you might have an accident, but suddenly there is an a a ambulance appears, and suddenly you are taken, and suddenly the doctor is the specialist, and all these things. That's the example he gave, how Baba takes care of his, his own in little ways. You have to go through it, but he find there are ways that the whole thing becomes less troublesome. And I, I would say that most Baba lovers accept that when things happen, uh, their consolation is, wow, it could have been so much worse. And anyway, it's all a dream. 
So the thing, the one true thing is, and it's especially important, having a birth, a lifetime, a birth during his advent and having the connection to him is that thinking of him while you go through things gives you much more freedom ultimately, a better dividend for your karmic debt than otherwise. This is something that the Mandala used to say. You're much, you're much, your suffering is worth so much more because you're aware of him. The other thing is that when you come in contact with any master, but specifically the avatar, that reaction, that tendency for the sanskaras to unwind happens. And Baba has said this term, you know, unwinding sanskaras. In the discourses, it sounds so, yes, that's very good, fine. Except when you're going through it sometimes, then it's not so easy. But it is what is happening. Next question, please. I think that's go here. Jay Baba, go here. Jay Baba, everyone. Peter, thank you so much. Hi, go here. <laughs> Jay Baba. Hey. I always have enjoyed your talk so, so much. Oh, thank um, you. And um, I just, to your last point, um, it is so true that if you're in the orbit of the ancient one of Baba, you, there have been so many instances in my own life where when things happen, as you just said, it just, it's mind boggling how he eases your path through that experience and you realize how very fortunate you are. So that, I mean, just small, in small ways, I can tell you so many incidents. Um, anyway, uh, but going back to the topic that we are discussing today and is so important, I have two stories to share with you that happened in our family. Um, the first one goes back to, well, as you know, my father, Minu Karas uh, of Karachi, was a very close Baba follower, Baba lover, and disciple, one of his circle of 120, as Baba said. So nothing in my father's life um, was done without his permission, without his knowledge, whatever. So he gets married at a late age um, in 1954. He was already in his mid forties. My mom was 20 years younger to him. And the very same year, nine months later, I come along and Baba names me after five months. That's a whole other story. But that was in 54. Now, and then in 1960, my brother Minerji comes along um, and Baba names both of us. <clears throat> in between my birth and his, and this goes back to um, sometime after my father had passed and my mom had come to stay with us. She stayed with us for almost 30 years, the last 30 years of her life. Um, she at one point mentioned that she had become pregnant uh, between the two of us. And in those years, my father was going through a lot of financial difficulty. Uh, life was very stressful. He was in Pakistan, Baba was in India. And I don't know how this got decided or how it you know, came to be, whether it was more my mother's decision or whether it was both of their decisions, I have no idea. But apparently she got pregnant and had an abortion. When finally, subsequently, when they met Baba uh, a little later on, and this was mentioned to him, Baba became very serious and very, very angry. And he told both of them, I told my mother, this should never have happened. But after being very serious for a while, he said, I forgive you this time. Make sure it never happens again. And then years later, my brother comes along in 1960. In 1986, after this is two years after my father had passed on, mom was living with us um, while she was in, on a visit here with us in New York. And my brother was a, 
an employee for Pan American Airways in Karachi. And as the result of a hijacking that took place at the airport, he lost his life in that incident. This, in, this absolutely crushed, I mean, my mother was never the same after this. She was devastated to say the least. Didn't get over it, um, spiraled into deep depression. Um, it just changed her entire being to, you know, and I've often wondered whether this somehow was his way of her going through that experience to somehow negate the karma that she induced when she had the abortion. So I just often wonder why that, why that whole experience happened to her, not, not to my father, because he had already was predeceased uh, two years ago. Um, and the second story is my own story. Um, so I was married in 74, came here, had three children. Um, when I was pregnant with my third one, I didn't realize at the time, but this was very early on um, in October of that year, I had to undergo knee surgery because of a very bad knee that I had. So I had to go undergo an arthroscopy under general anesthesia. A few weeks after the operation, we realized that I was pregnant. I had not known that at that time. My husband, who is a physician himself, was very concerned because of the effects of anesthesia on the fetus. And he was, you know, we already had two children, a boy and a girl, a girl and a boy rather. And he was very concerned about the effects of the anesthesia and how, you know, it would affect the fetus and whatever. And he mentioned about terminating the pregnancy. I point blank refused. No way ever was I going to go through with anything like that. And today, 36 years later, we have a beautiful daughter, Natasha, who is, of course, one of the three joys of my life. And I am so grateful to Baba that um, that's, that's how that went. So, Jay Baba, that's Jay my Baba. story. <laughs> yes. Uh, when Meherji died, it was quite a shock for us all. Yes, the Mandli is, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought about that and looked back on it, especially looking at the history of hijacking. Mm -hmm. Really, that was maybe the first in that series of hijackings that happened through the years. Yes. That garnered all that attention in the news. Yes. And really, those, all of that series of hijackings seemed to end with the attack on 911. Yeah. So it is almost as if archetypally Baba allowed this series of events mm -hmm. to begin with one of his own. Yeah. And being connected to Baba, I just felt something archetypally has happened here. And I believe he was, Maharji played that role. Yes. And we take these things in life and death seriously. But he must have been tremendously relieved of some ancient burden yeah. by being murdered in mm -hmm. the plane like that. Yeah. And I, I, knowing him, I always felt sure that he must have been very brave and said something, and that's what precipitated the attack on him. Mm -hmm. Because he would have been the one to stand up and say something and do something. Mm -hmm. Well, he was the, the only one on the aircraft that was trapped inside who knew the workings of the radio. Mm -hmm. And he was the one to facilitate conversation between the hijackers and the terminal and mm -hmm. his boss uh, to try and come to some understanding, agreement, whatever. But um, so, yeah, so he did play a key role in that aspect. Mm -hmm. However, what else? Um, he said or thought, I, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. His wife would, wanted very much, Jasmine, my sister-in-law, wanted very much to go to the airport and just to be able, because she knew that he was communicating with his boss and she just wanted to be there to talk to him over the radio. 
but they had sealed off the, the yeah. airport and she had, she was not allowed to yeah yeah hmm. yes yeah thank you go here hmm. rosalie did you have a question uh, yeah i do peter j baba you shared from Phyllis's book, Love Bade Me Welcome. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember reading that book and I was astounded by this little, what Baba said to her. And that was, she said she was, felt like she was struck by lightning. So you have the book there. Can you just read that little bit where Baba starts gesturing quickly? animatedly and what he says about your eyes will weep and weep. Can you share because you I want that again? Uh, that just that little bit. Okay. Please. Let me find that. I, I definitely copied it out. So I want to know. I I'll read know. that again. Thank you. Then Baba began to gesture with great animation, many movements of hands and Erich interpreted your eyes will weep and weep and weep and your heart will burn and burn and burn and burn and will be consumed and you will experience the real. The impact of these words was like a lightning bolt in Phyllis's consciousness, filling her with sudden overwhelming awe and love for Meher Baba and recognition of his wondrous love and power. And if you recall, whenever Phyllis would, rarely she would tell the story, but she would tell the story and she would go on and Bob would say, you will burn and burn and burn and burn. But so what's so interesting is I had her burning more. I thought I copied it out of the book, but I had her burning five times, even four times. Was maybe, maybe it was five times. Uh, well, I, that's what I want to know of you, because uh -huh. I'm sure she'd remember in the yeah. book, you, you showed the book, it's page 71. Yeah. I'm just very curious about mm -hmm. it. Uh, I'll look it up. Whether, whether it's, it could, have, it could be five times, but, but point, point is, whether it was, I assume that a person who has one interview with Baba or two will remember certain things, but of course, these things are recollected afterwards and written. Yeah, but what, what is the book? You have okay. the book. What does the book say? Here okay. it says, quote. Yeah. Here's the quote. Let me show Rosalie. <laughs> yeah. Rosalie, here we got it. Okay. Yeah. Page 71. Okay, yeah. sir. Yes, your eyes will weep and weep and weep and your heart will burn and burn and burn and burn and burn and will be consumed. Yeah. Five times. Mm -hmm. Burn and burn and burn and but burn and burn. People, but, people, uh, people get the general idea. I know it, but you know. Uh, okay. it's, don't, uh, don't get involved. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Judy. Good memory, Rosalie. Yeah. Hi, Judy. Peter. Wonderful to, wonderful talk, and it's always good when you are generous enough to share your great knowledge with us. Um, someplace in my little brain, I have stored a piece of information, which I'm not sure is accurate. Um, and that is that, um, <clears throat> that Baba said that the soul enters the, um, the fetus at four months is um, first of all is that accurate do you know no, what what we have heard is that Baba said generally the soul enters the fetus during the sixth or seventh month ah that's very that deep. does not mean the soul might not come earlier but it's not at the point of conception there's no right. purpose in that there's no purpose in that but we do have examples of reincarnation 
where the soul enters the body just before birth, within days. And I, we watch, sometimes we watch these stories of reincarnation on YouTube. They're interesting. And once in a while you get one of these stories where the person says, I was that person. I recall a story of uh, a, a boy in India who remembered his recent birth and he was murdered and he was reborn as a boy again and right on that spot on his head where he was shot was a birthmark but he remembered his past life clearly and the name of himself previously and they looked up the history of that person and sure enough he had died just a few days before this boy was born so it was an example for, for, for one example that we could see that there's no we can't say that there's a clear-cut rule it could even happen very late but Baba had said generally and this is something that the Mandali had told us generally the soul enters the fetus in the sixth or seventh month or and, between six and seven like that and given what else you've shared this morning especially Phyllis's situation um can can we assume that any drop soul that is aborted um especially um between you know six for the first six months or whatever <clears throat> would um, get a reassignment you know that they uh, that however um uh, whether bob is up there absolutely every soul has to the whole purpose of it is to give the gift of life to the spirit so that sanskaras can be spent it's all about that what drives life and consciousness is the soul it's not vice versa the body does not give consciousness consciousness demands a body the problem with the materialistic physical perspective is that it's back that paradigm is backwards that's the problem with science and even western religion it's superficial it's not deep that paradigm is upside down consciousness doesn't come from the brain the brain is a result of consciousness demanding a physical link the mind consciousness in the mind demanding a physical link to the physical form so the brain is there the people assume that the brain is consciousness because all four of the five senses are centered around the brain the eyes sight hearing smell taste feeling is everywhere but then the assumption is that brain creates consciousness it's not that it's a medium to allow the the mind to and can we also assume that those drop souls that are um aborted needed um somehow to experience the frustration a very short, a yeah. very short life yeah. well we could look at it this maybe they were persons who aborted fetuses in past lives and now they had the experience because the law of karma is precise but the point to remember is that the law of karma works upon motive not through action so in the case of abortion all abortions are not the same to say all abortions must stop is is not practical it's not compassionate the life of the mother is at stake it's a practical medical issue in that sense people can say to the mother maybe you'll have another try again to have a baby if an abortion happens because somebody was promiscuous and they just don't want to have the responsibility of illicit sex that's low that the sense scars for that are very binding very binding it is an act 
to escape responsibility. So there's a karmic debt there. And in in Go Hare's story of her of her mother, of Baba saying, I'll forgive you this time, but don't do it again. Mm -hmm. Do we does Baba has has Baba said anything more specific than that around the issue of abortion? No, it was very it was pretty obvious. Like Baba wouldn't say don't commit murder to people. It's pretty obvious. He wouldn't say, don't steal things. Some people he did. Some people he would say, why are you still stealing things? Stop stealing. But for most people, he didn't have to say, don't steal things. But he would say, like, don't tell lies. You know, do, he would mostly say things like, be honest, be simple, and be forgiving, and be you know, that, that kind of a, things that were more vague. But for things that were very definite, it was pretty obvious you don't do those things. So in the circle of Baba's family of lovers, it wasn't an issue. This is an issue for people of the world. And that's why it became, but now the solution to this is a different story. It's easy to say, don't do this or do that. As I say, they're extreme. The perspectives on each side of the argument are deficient because they don't have the picture, the deeper picture. It's not such an easy issue to resolve. That's why it's been going on and on all the time. The problem is that each individual has different circumstances that compel them to do such a thing. So the motive is always different. Now, who's to judge that? Not a church. And they say also, it's not fair for the law to do that. Okay, but then there's an issue there. The fundamental defect is the morality in humanity. It's a spiritual disease. It is believing that we are our physical bodies and that the purpose of life is to indulge in comforts of the physical body. And we end up with these problems. So it is a complex thing, and I say the real issue is dictating to anybody what path they should take is problematic. It's problematic. But Bob but didn't get Roe Ro versus Wade, for an example, wasn't just uh, an act that was libertarian. It was trying to find a balance, you know, in the case of this, in the case of that, up to so much time, they're allowing it now, they say. And that was a compromise. So practically speaking, there has to be some compromise, but there can't be with people who don't have a proper perspective. What we got from Baba was a proper perspective. So an issue like abortion is more easily resolved for people who are who understand his perspective. And beyond that, Baba didn't give specific guidelines. No, no. Uh, it was just it was it was not an issue so much. And Baba wouldn't condemn any person in poverty. Who, who was at the point of, you know, the bots were not wealthy. They, they really spent, they were lucky to get to India. And as they say, even more poor than they were their good friends, the Rileys. They were struggling artists in Woodstock. And the, what they wanted to do was create art. But creating art was not such a financially viable thing. It wasn't a regular job. If you sold some art, good luck. It's still that way. But people who love to be artists are dedicated to it. It's just difficult to support a family that way. Thank you, Peter. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. And Robin? Hi, yeah, hi, Peter. This is hi, Robin. Hi. Um, 
I also like to watch YouTube and some of the near-death experiences and some of the pre-death experiences. And this guy, Christian Sundberg, is on a lot of different interviews. And he remembers before he was born. And at one point, he uh, aborted the fetus he was in because he couldn't stand how veiled he was becoming. And he really describes that extremely well. And then he still, though, wants to, you know, have the experience that he's going to gain from having a body. And so he comes into another fetus and he almost does it again because it's so excruciating to be uh, made so much less aware of everything. And um, but he does continue with that life. But his the way he describes it, I think, would be it's just so interesting and really gives a great perspective on on the whole process. Yes. And now that you mentioned that coming into a body, Baba said that that is why most people can't remember their past because the shock uh, of adjusting to the new little body and the getting into that brain is uh, just, uh, it, it rattles the mind enough so that that past memory is, becomes vague, maybe in glimpses through the subconscious in the form of dreams, but not, usually not openly remembered. Thank you, Peter. And Rosalie has one other thing. Okay, Baba. Uh, I remember this moment in time when uh, the porch, the gathering on the porch with Mara had just broken up. And uh, I would always linger off the porch, but till we had the alibi was ringing the bell, ringing the bell, board the bus, get your things. And this one time there was, Mara was still on the porch and there was a very tall man uh, talking to her. He, was, he actually was asking her to pray for him. And, um, and their, their heights were so extreme because Mara was not very tall. And, uh, and then I heard Mara say, uh, yes, I will pray for you, but first you have to pray yourself. And I just think that's worth hearing. And I took note of it. I thought, wow, okay, you must pray for yourself. Yeah, that's just what I wanted to share. Because, you know, Baba would give Mara, you know, she, you know, she had the inside acceptance. Yeah, yeah, anyway. Thank you, Peter, for your sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> Ruth? Yes. A couple people had written questions. Can you Yes, read? I saw that. Elizabeth asked, um, what, about what about childless, for example, married couples without children or single women? Mm -hmm. Did Baba have anything to say about being childless? Uh, no, he said things specifically to people. Um, Depends who, who they were. They were ch childless couples. It was not uncommon in the world of Baba's lovers. Debbie and I don't have any children. Mara kind of got involved in our engagement and asked Debbie about children. And this is very rare for Mara. And she kind of looked away and said, no, no children. You, you're it's better you uh, something like you're too old now. Uh, better not to have children. But the point is, children for us would have been a distraction, because our lives are focused on uh, work for Baba. So, well, I I'm not concerned about that. It's I have a different look at things. I'm not yearning for children and all. I grew up in a family of eleven, <laughs> and. I love children, other people's, like I love other people's pets, but we are free of responsibility in that sense. So yeah, it's, there were some. Uh, there was another, I'll tell you another little thing that Eric used to say in, 
70s. From time to time, I mentioned that Erich would tell stories in the early years that he stopped telling. And you could just hear that so-and-so wrote to Arnavaz, and, and then Monty got a hold of the information, and they had some misunderstanding about some story that Erich told, and that was the end of the story. So, there, you know, there were kind of things like this that would happen sometimes. One of those stories Erich told in the 70s was, he said, once we were here and a young couple came after their marriage for Baba's blessing, and Baba made the comment. Baba, very forthright and direct with some people, he said, how often are you going to have sex? Are you going to have sex? And they were shy, just married. I guess so, Baba. Hmm. How much? I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Baba said, you can have sex once. If you want to have sex more than once, he said, keep a shovel by your bedside because you'll have to dig your own graves. This is what he told that couple. It's not, it's not doesn't mean that everybody it applies to everybody. And you could see that the misunderstanding of some people, especially repressive people, would take that and run with it, trying to be ideal or something. When Baba said that to that couple. He did say that. But it's one of those stories that must be qualified in context. So it happens. Of course, he told other people to remain abstinent, never marry, and it's not, your, not for you. He told other people, no children yet? Keep trying. And they weren't, weren't even that concerned about it because it was Baba's order. That, it's a rare thing, but sometimes he would say that. So we don't know. It depends upon the person's nature, their sense cars. Mm -hmm. Keep a shovel. But when I saw that question, yeah. Baba's comment was, if you want to have sex more than once, keep a shovel by your bedside because you'll have to dig your own graves. But that's but Erich, you know, people don't realize this, especially in the early days. Erich was really the old soldier. And he was the Mondali had they had an extreme lifestyle. They they were they lived that life of self control through love. Not only as examples, but they that was the norm for them. Like when you read uh, the conditions of the new life, and they all had to do this, don't do that, don't take money, don't don't eat this, don't if you look at people like Padre. They already lived like that. It wasn't anything new to them. There were maybe a couple of conditions that were new, but it was nothing for them to get conditions from Baba. They they were the slaves, the servants. Whatever he said. That's what they did. Dan had a comment. I don't know what it was. Dan Sparks. Yeah, I'm looking too. There. Anyway. Yeah, I don't see Dan. Okay. Either. I, I have to say one thing that I read in Lord Mayhair, and you, you had such contact with Padre. At one point in the early days, Baba Padre was cooking. They were traveling and he was had the task of cooking. And Baba was very pleased with his service and he gave them the antlers of a deer. Is mm -hmm. what it said. Do you remember something like that? Mm -hmm. I, just that. <laughs> I don't know if he ever saved that stuff. Well, no, I, we, it, after it, he it, died, it, we didn't find it in his treasure chest after he died. It was a personal item. The treasure yeah. chest Padre had under his bed was items that re, that uh, were were all Baba's, which included a, a 
a brass plaque engraved each letter at a time with the table of contents of all of those things. Those antlers weren't in there. There are other things, you know. Pendu's garland from the 1938 work. Different things that were personal items. I'm, I'm assuming that many personal items will be in the archives at Maribad. I don't really know. <laughs> that was from the 19, I believe that was from the 1929 trip to Kashmir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have the map. Padre gave me the map for that trip. Wow. Where he had traced the route in red ink. I had the original, his original map he gave me. I have it in my closet at Maribad. And now that I let the truth out, it might have to go back to the archive somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you got to give those antlers up, Peter. Yes. <laughs> Well, Dan actually is here, Dan Sparks, but I don't know if he has a question or comment. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Hi, Dan. Hey, brother, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, I, I just uh, sent you a personal thanks for the presentation. Okay. And uh, And and the Jai Baba and best wishes. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a specific question. I, I'm glad to just open my mouth and say hi. And Okay, it's, it's, it's good to see that. you. Yeah, thank good you. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. Likewise, wonderful to see you and everybody. Yeah, this is good. This is a great one. Really, okay. really lovely. Thanks. Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. J Baba. J Baba. All right. J Baba. Last chance. Oh, there's a hand, Ralph Jackson. Oh, go ahead, Ralph. I'm sorry, I muted you by mistake. Uh, this is for Peter and and whomsoever wants to respond but hi old friend hi peter j baba j baba maybe we'll get together someday yes yeah hey about abortion about not not that baba would be obliged to say a whole lot but apparently he through the experience of some of Baba's lovers like Phyllis and Gohair's mom having abortions. Um, did I get that right? Correct. Yeah. You know, he sort of, we can sort of just uh, formulate that or do the math and say that's pretty much how by, according to Baba's reactions, well, in one case, I don't get the get the idea that he reprimanded Phyllis or anything, but uh, arrangements that Baba was aware of and, and and had personally been involved, you know, through the spirit world of taking care of that child. Um, uh, and then in Gohair's instance, you know, he obviously was not happy. And but I don't know if we can take that so broadly as to say there's so many factors involved with the possibilities of or potential to say it might be better to have an abortion. I mean, we're like the mother's life is it definitely at risk or absolutely going to be forfeit? So a lot of things you hear a lot, but on the matter of abortion and when life, life of the fetus, somehow, and, and when I thought about it, I had to say, have I ever read, but throughout my life with Baba, you know, since 1967, 68, 
I never heard anything about seven months. It was I always had the impression or thought I'd heard and presumed that I had even read, but now I don't read, haven't been able, had the time to do that much reading. And, but in the past year or two, I've been hearing Baba said, so the, the child, that spirit doesn't enter the fetus until seven months. But I always heard or presumed it was at the moment of conception that that identity was that the bond was made at the at the moment of conception. Yes. So, yeah. and I don't know. And it's possible Baba said both because there are definitely places you read where, not to say Baba contradicts himself, but that. Two things can be true when you think if you think about it or not. Consider it deeply. Okay, there there are two different issues here. One is the assignment of the body, and one is when the soul enters that body. They're two different issues. So the assignment of the body is even made, as we know in Baba's case, before the pregnancy. Yeah. Like what he said to Amrit, you'll have two sons and don't come back to India until they're born in England. Yeah, yeah. But then there's the, there is the entering of the spirit into the, the entity into the womb. And we, I can say only one place for sure we can say that this is documented is in uh, the book Larry and Rita Karish had written on Harry Kenmore. And it's a recording of a transcription of Harry's, uh, where Harry asked, asked Erich. Erich about this, and Erich made the comment six to seven months. So it's, it's documented through Erich, through a transcription of a recording with Erich, that that is the case. So we take that as and we know that's the general, the general fact. That yeah. This is what Baba had said. Uh, one thing about this is that uh, every every comment Baba made is not recorded or published per se. There are we are still in the age where certain people heard certain things from people close to Baba. And the difference in that kind of it, we don't call that hearsay, it has to be uh, confirmed in, in as best a way as possible to be considered a fact. But we, I, I, would, I would never say that this was written in such and such a book so it's true or not. Yeah. But of course, books written by Baba with his signature, we take that as fact. We take that as fact. Uh, Lord Mayher is a mine of facts and information. And yet, sometimes there are little, little things that are inaccurate in there. And I've seen Bao do this himself. So people have complained that Bao was arbitrarily writing. Baba ordered Bao to write his biography. And I've seen this more than once when people would come to Bao and say, you know, you have written in Lord Mayher that on such and such a day, Baba did this and went there and did that. But he said, in fact, I was there and it was like this and that. And Bao would say, oh, I'm sorry. Go and tell David Fenster and he'll fix it. So the two things that are important. One, Bao is accepting that there are little errors. And two, now you have, in my, I can say as an eyewitness, David Venster had the mandate to make repairs constantly, which he still does. If something comes up in somebody's little letter or something, that gets added. So he's made a lot of additions and little corrections to Lord Mayhair. That goes on. So that there shouldn't be a conflict about Lord Mayhair. It's a great piece of work. Every volume of Lord Mayhair from the very first one that was 
frankly, put out in a hurry, and it's good it was. I was involved with getting Hermes to do that work. Otherwise, there would have been many more mistakes in the future, waiting for some qualified writer to take on the work. It had to be people who lived during Baba's lifetime to be able to serve as eyewitnesses to events to make all the little corrections. And that's been going on from the day it was first published. Including Mani Asirani, who would make little comments about a certain person. I have one she wrote, typed to me, and I put it in one of the first volumes about a person that adds a lot of information. Uh, and Goher may, may remember this person or not. I don't, re I don't, I don't think Goher rem remembers her. Korshid Pastakia, who was a great Baba lover from Karachi, but I think she died before Korshid, uh, before Goher was born. Yes, that's right. I had not met her, but I'd heard of her. Yeah. R Rhoda Dubash knew her very well. Yes, and Rhoda, yeah. the one place where we get good information about Korshid Pastakia is from Rhoda, who, yes. who wrote that poignant story about her life and death. Yes, yeah. Yes. She came to know of Baba through Korshid. Mm-hmm. Okay, are there any other questions? Yes, Greg Dunn has a comment or question for you. Okay. Um, hi, Peter. Wonderful, hi, Greg. Wonderful talk and wonderful discussion. Um, I just wanted to mention there is, there is a reference to this business in uh, the discourse Death and Immortality and Part Two of Bliss and Humanity. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'll read it to you because there's just three sentences. Mm -hmm. It doesn't resolve the question entirely, but it kind of at least half does, uh, like in terms of the question as, as Ralph posed it a minute ago. So here's what it says. It says, if the good and evil sanskaras of the individual are almost balanced at the time of death, he may take on a new physical body almost immediately. He may even enter a new incarnation as early as the fourth day after death. In such urgent cases of rebirth, the individual can enliven a ready fetus any time between the sixth and seventh month of embryological development. That's most clear. Thank That's you. it. That's wow, definitive. That's awesome. So, and both issues are stated there. And where was that from again? It's in Listen Humanity, part two, uh, in the discourse death and immortality and of course that group of discourses um, baba personally handed to don stevens to include in the book i think it was in 1955 that he did that at the the four languages sahabas and at that at that time baba told him that he had done that sort of same painstaking process that he did with the first eight chapters of god speaks Namely, that he bedded the thing word for word. I mean, he gave points, someone wrote it up, and then Baba went over it word for word. So Baba said that about that whole group of discourses that Don included in Listen Humanity. Right. right, and those discourses are a great addition to all the earlier discourses. Some of them are repeated from earlier discourses. These are discourses that Baba gave during the 55 Sahabas, the month-long Sahabas during November of 1955. And many of them are relevant to the, the group of Indian men who had come for that. But it's a great addition, great addition to the yeah. series of discourses. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. And Miss Betty. Jay Baba. Jay Baba, thank you so much, Peter. This has just been riveting. I can't wait to go listen, listen again. Oh dear, sorry. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to, since there's so many people who, long time Baba lovers here, uh, to put in a plug, we're having a meeting in two weeks of reminiscences and stories of early 70s at Maribad Zad at, at this time. Uh, I mean, this Saturday, September 3rd at, at the, in, in the morning, 11 o'clock. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to since there's so many of you here to invite you to please think of stories and come in a couple of weeks. Yeah, Baba. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so Baba. Much, Thank you to Baba Zoom because it's such a great way for all of us to be connected and remember him. So thank you.
One other thing part uh, I'd have to bring up, uh, Charles asked Peter if you could tell another story that Erich has ceased telling. Yes, I will do that in another okay. meeting. Okay, <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> yes, show business. Hi, Sue. Hi, I just came on to thank you, Peter and Debbie. It's great to see you and oh, what a great session. You. Thank you so much. Hey, Baba. Thank you, Baba. <laughs> Baba. Well, I need, this is it. That's Last it. chance. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Should we have a moment of silence hey, together? Yes, okay. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Baba. Thank you, Jay Baba. Good night, everyone. Wonderful. Time is. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Ruth, for being our host today. So grateful. Thank you.